Stanford University. Welcome. I'm Dr. Tia Rich, founder and director of Stanford Medicine's Contemplation by Design program. In this session, Dr. Sue Stewart Smith joins us from England to talk about the well gardened mind, the restorative power of nature. Dr. Sue Stewart Smith, a prominent psychiatrist and psychotherapist, graduated in English literature at Cambridge University before going on to train as a doctor. She worked in the National Health Service for many years as a physician, becoming the lead clinician for psychotherapy in Hertfordshire. She currently teaches at the Travis Dock Clinic in London and works for Doc Health, a not-for-profit service that helps doctors suffering from stress and burnout. She is married to Tom Stewart Smith, the celebrated garden designer. And after 30 years together, they have created the wonderful Barn Garden in Hertfordshire. Her book, The Well Garden Mind, was published in 2020 and became a Sunday Times bestseller and a Times and Sunday Times Book of the Year. The book has been translated into 15 languages. It is also available as an audio book read by the author, Dr. Sue Stewart Smith. We now warmly welcome Dr. Stewart Smith. Thank you very much, Tia. I'm really pleased to be able to join, join you uh, and everybody here for this conference. It sounds like a, a wonderful event. So I'm gonna share my screen so I can start. So um, everything I say today is linked uh, to, to my book, uh, The Well Garden Mind, which came out uh, last summer, very early in the pandemic. Um, and, and having researched and, and worked on it for five years, it was very extraordinary to find it coming out into the world at a time when people were suddenly um, a bit more receptive to some of the messages in the book. You know, many people found with the stress of the pandemic and uh, all the uncertainty and fear that was around that, that the presence of nature was one of the, one of the few consoling and, and reliable things in their lives. It's a book that, that weaves together various strands of things that I'm interested in from psychotherapy and psychoanalysis to neuroscience, but also anthropology and philosophy and history. Um, and I draw on various thinkers and I'll mention a couple of them today, uh, particularly um, Sigmund Freud and Donald Winnicott, two landmark psychoanalysts. As I, I wrote the book very much with our current mental health situation in mind, um, you know, the way that in the decade leading up to this, uh, levels of anxiety and depression have been rising. And at the same time, a growing recognition that our way of life has become unsustainable, not only psychologically, but also very importantly, ecologically. Um, on the, you know, this is the first day in this country of the COP26 uh, conference. Um, so climate change is very much in all our minds. So I want to really focus on that as well in terms of how gardening might contribute to um, reversing a situation which fundamentally one can summarize as a, a neglect of what people need to thrive as well as a neglect of what the planet needs to thrive. So this is a slide taken this summer in our garden at home in Hertfordshire and some of you may recognize the, the flowers, they're camassias, um, they're bulbs and they flower here every summer towards the end of May and on to June, and they're incredibly beautiful. I write about them in the book uh, in relation to the history of cultivation, and in particular, one example uh, linked to the history of colonialism. So in 1843, James Douglas, who was a British explorer, landed on the south shores of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. He was looking for a new trading post for the Hudson's Bay Company. And what he stumbled on was exquisite meadowlands of these blue flowers. Um, 
and they were set, set amongst a range of, of trees, but a lot of them were ancient Gary Oaks. This, he decided, was an untouched Eden. The air was full of butterflies um, and the blue flowers were obviously quite astonishing. The settlers arrived and they ploughed up a lot of these meadows for agricultural land, which actually didn't turn out to be very suitable for farming. Um, but what was not clear at that stage or what the, what the settlers uh, chose not to see was that this was the ancestral home of the Lekwungen tribe of the Coast Salish people. Uh, these were people who fished and who foraged, but who had also cultivated these meadows for many, many generations um, and, and passed their garden plots within these meadows down through the matrilineal line. Every summer they would gather and harvest uh, the edible bulbs, which were a delicacy and were sacred. But they would also return the smaller bulbs to the soil uh, it, to give them time to mature and remove the, so there was a poisonous plant that grew in these meadows as well, uh, something called the death camas, which is from the Zygodanus family. Um, so these meadows were actually cultivated and they were spiritual places. Um, and, and I wanted in writing my book to really look at the origins of cultivation um, and understand how perhaps our, our Paleolithic or late Paleolithic and early Neolithic ancestors worked the land and their relationship to it. And, and the evidence suggests that it was a much more spiritual relationship and, and also a relationship that was intrinsically bound up with care and nurture. Ethnographic studies have shown that indigenous tribes, for example, who, who both forage and hunt and cultivate, distinguish very little between caring for their children and caring for their plants. It's, it's a concept, it's an understanding and a way of life in which humans and plants are part of one nature and have shared qualities that connect them. And that I think is something that we need to recover given the planetary crisis that we're facing, is an understanding that we too are part of nature. So this is another photograph taken in my greenhouse last summer. Actually, it was sort of late spring, really. Um, and as you can see, it's little seedlings. And I thought I'd just reflect on what happened the summer before when the pandemic just started. And, and there was a rush on seeds, both in this country and in North America. Everybody's plans were cancelled. Um, nobody could think about the future in anything other than a negative way or, or anxious way. Gardening provided one of the few openings to get involved in something, which was, which, you know, gardening is intrinsically forward looking, which gave a sense of positive anticipation about something, uh, about an involvement. Uh, you know, a few months ahead, a way of looking forward uh, with pleasure. And it's, the, it's absolutely intrinsic to, to the way in which horticulture can help people suffering from um, de depression, for example, or anxiety, and also recovering from trauma. Because in all these conditions, uh, thinking about the future is intrinsically problematic and often experienced as, as a negative or overwhelming idea. So gardening helps people shape a little bit of their lives. And I'm going to show you um, my own vegetable plot. Uh, this was taken last July, and you can just see the beans beginning to climb up the, the bean pole uh, on the left. Um, but as you can also see, there are a lot of flowers here um, and uh, it's actually a very productive garden, but I do encourage the annual flowers. Most of them seed themselves uh, around the garden. You can see the poppies and the eschultzia and the verbena. And it's something that I really celebrate about my garden is that I'm not completely in control. Um, I will occasionally remove some of them because you know they really are too many of them or they're in the way, but, but I try and leave, leave as many as I can where they've popped up. And for me, this is part of the pleasure of gardening. I feel that we enter into a relationship which is a little bit like a delayed but sustained dialogue 
you know, in a sense that, that I can do a little bit in the garden and then I have to wait and see how nature responds. And then I respond to that response. And it's so helpful sometimes to feel part of something larger. You know, we can get very, very caught up in our own, uh, in our own worlds, our own small circles in life. Um, and to be taken out of that uh, can be enormously refreshing. The other important aspect about this way of gardening is that it's very good for biodiversity. And that really is something that we do need to attend to. And it's something which I think in the face of the powerlessness that many people feel in the face of, of the planetary crisis, it is something fairly simple that everybody can do if they have access to a small plot, is to just make sure that what is growing in it is varied enough and suitable to encourage birds, insects, and also um, everything that's in the soil. You know, garden soils are often a, a very rich source of, of um, microbes. And it's so important for us all that we sustain these things. I'm going to introduce my grandfather, Ted May, because he was one of the um, inspirations for the book, really, uh, and his story features within, the, within its pages. This is a photo of Ted taken in his 60s in his greenhouse uh, with the orchids that he loved growing uh, and which he won prizes for. He lived on a small holding where my mother grew up. Uh, he was a great vegetable grower and, and he had a small orchard, he kept bees and so on. But I grew up with Ted's story, although I didn't hear very much about it. But what I knew was that he had been a prisoner of war in the First World War. He'd been captured in Turkey as a very young man and he'd spent the whole, the whole of the First World War after the spring of 1915 in a series of, of really brutal labor camps. As I discovered on looking into this part of our history, he was very lucky to make it home. 70% of the prisoners who were captured in Turkey, the, the, the servicemen who were captured, didn't come home afterwards. The First World War was in many ways the beginning of horticultural therapy. And Ted was very fortunate that in 1920, when he was beginning to recover some of his physical strength, thanks to my grandmother's careful nursing of him, um, that he got the opportunity to attend a year long uh, horticultural rehabilitation training, uh, one of many such schemes that the, the government here were setting up. I didn't know where this had happened and, and it was one of the things that I set out on in researching the book was to find it and I, I'm not going to go into that here but, um, but I do find it and it's described in the book. But the most important feature of it that I do want to highlight here is that I discovered that it had a large number of glass houses where exotic plants were grown. Things like camellias and, and palms and so on. And, and for me, I suddenly made a link to Ted's love of his orchids and how in his own very small greenhouse at home, he was recapturing, I think, something of that extraordinary experience of, of, of light and, and warmth and beauty in those glass houses where really his life was, was, was restored to him. I'll say a little bit more about the First World War because it is so important uh, in terms of thinking about the recognition of the benefits of gardening and nature. Um, this slide is taken from the Imperial War Museum uh, collection and it's um, a photograph of the back wall of one of the trenches on the front lines on the Western Front. This trench was um, manned by soldiers from the Argyll and Southern and Highlanders. This was actually taken in the spring of 1915, probably almost exactly when Ted was captured in, in the run-up to Gallipoli. The man in the foreground in front of the little garden was called Captain Irvin and we know that he was killed three months later. So what were these soldiers doing, creating gardens in a battle zone? And this was not an isolated incident. There are accounts of this in the soldiers' letters and from journalists who visited and reported home. They were thrust into the most terrifying 
and destructive environment uh, you could possibly imagine, surrounded by mud and blasted trees and death and noise and bombardment all around them. And these little gardens gave them a way of holding on to a different kind of reality. They grew annual flowers, some of which sort of are very similar to the ones I'm growing in my vegetable garden. They wrote home asking relatives to send them seeds. And what they wanted was beauty and familiar flowers as well. So this is actually taken towards the end of the war in the autumn of 1917. And this is a soldier from the Gordon Highlanders. And you can see the real concentration with which he's watering his flowers. These little gardens were actually found on both sides of the lines. The, the German soldiers also created them. Uh, I think they really were a psychological lifeline. And there's a phrase that came into being through the work of the socio-ecologist Keith Tidball, who has studied and written about gardening in conflict zones, modern day gardening in conflict zones, post-conflict areas, as well as in the aftermath of natural disasters. And he refers to it as a phenomenon that he calls um, urgent biophilia. So this urgent pressing need to reconnect with our love of nature at times of dire crisis. And the trench gardens are a very powerful example of that. But I think we saw it very generally around the world, uh, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, when the lockdowns were taking place. And nature, as I said, offered really one of the few de-stressing and consoling environments in which you could immerse yourself. The other thing I just want to add about care is that care is intrinsically linked in the brain to our endorphin system. You know, you can see the sense of almost peacefulness on this man's face. So, so simple acts of nurturing, whether that's looking after house plants, it may be, it's not, it's not only about plants, maybe pets, it may be people, um, but, but simple acts of, of nurture can give rise to all the feelings that go with an endorphin release. So a feeling of calmness, a bit of a mood boost, uh, an intrinsic feeling of pleasure. And that's very important. And I think we've sort of lost sight of the value of care, the importance of care um, in terms of sustaining our mental health. Care is very often seen as a depleting activity, which of course it can be, you know, care is onerous, of course it is that. But, but actually having something to care for and care about is very important in terms of sustaining our mental health. This is a, a photograph of an um, English therapeutic garden, a long running mental health project in Oxfordshire called Bridewell Walled, Walled Gardens. And I wanted to show this because it illustrates um, so beautifully, first of all, the idea of a garden as a space that's set apart, that's different, um, and that's enclosed. So in this country, we have a long tradition of walled gardens, particularly linked with country houses and country estates. What this kind of setting offers is a, a crucial experience of safety and escape of sanctuary and that effect is absolutely vital in trying to help anyone who is recovering, for example, from post-traumatic stress disorder. That's the position, the only position from which you can start any form of therapy, horticultural or otherwise, is to establish a feeling of safety. What this slide also shows is a sort of range of different areas within the garden. And that's very important in thinking about how horticulture can help people. So there are the, the raised beds, the linear beds, the, the working beds, the productive beds. You can see them there in the foreground, uh, the glass house, um, uh, the fruit cage. But then towards the upper part of the slide, you can see um, more secluded areas in the garden, places where people can can retreat and, and be quiet for a bit of time, a bit of time, to connect with nature, to be on their own, or maybe to have um, 
you know, a one-to-one -one conversation with, with someone in a setting within which they feel relaxed. I'm gonna, this is another slide from one of the therapeutic gardens that I visited when I was researching the book. This one is um, in Alnarp in Sweden. Uh, it's based at the University of Agricultural Sciences near Malmö. It's an important center for research. The team there have published over the last 15 years since the garden was opened, a number of uh, research papers about the process of horticultural rehabilitation. What this slide shows is, is one of the, the uh, secluded areas of the garden. There are, there are many productive areas as well. And when people first start this course here, um, the, the first thing that the therapists ask people to do is not, not to start growing anything or digging the soil, but is simply to find somewhere on their own in the garden where they are able to sit and reconnect with their bodies and, and with their senses uh, and with nature around them. And you can see here, there's the hammock, there's the pool of water and the large stone, which sometimes people sit on top of. In doing this, they're very much drawing on the work of the American psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, uh, Harold Searles, who was writing in the 1960s and 1970s. What he described through observing the patients he was treating in the, in the asylum where he was working at the time, was um, the importance of non-human forms of life in people's recovery. And what he noticed was that particularly trees, very often it would be trees, but sometimes large stones, offered people a sense of stability um, when they'd been traumatized or when they'd had a breakdown, both stability and endurance. Um, and, and these features interestingly came across very strongly in the interviews that I did with veterans recovering from post-traumatic stress. Now, I'm going to say a little bit about Sigmund Freud. He features a certain amount in the book. Uh, it's not very well known that he was a great nature lover, that he was actually, um, as a young man, something of an amateur botanist. And later in life, when he developed cancer of the mouth, he was forbidden to travel by his doctors. That was a long period, it was the last 16 years. Uh, and unable to travel as he always had done every summer to the Alps where he would go hiking and botanizing, he turned to, to the garden. He used to rent a villa on the outskirts of Vienna each summer and uh, see his patients there and spend as much time as possible in the garden. And this is actually uh, taken in the garden of the Freud Museum in London, which was his home. Uh, for, for the last year of his life, between September 1938 and September 1939. Freud didn't actually, I think, do any hands-on gardening, but he was a particular lover of flowers. And he once said, flowers are restful to look at. They have neither conflicts or emotions. This idea, I mentioned earlier, the importance of a simple nurturing relationship. This idea that plants and flowers and trees, um, we can relate to them in a slightly different way uh, is important. And it, particularly in prisons, for example, where some of the prisoners described in everyday life having to deal with a great deal of shame, for example, and, and being very aware of what other people's thoughts and judgments were about them. And they really valued working with plants that as Freud says, don't have don't have complex emotions uh, and don't have thoughts. This is one more slide of Freud showing him in his garden bed. And he had this constructed when he was living in Vienna um, and he brought it with him as a refugee when he managed to escape in 1938. And at this point, when this is taken, he's dying and the bed really gave him a way of continuing to, to benefit from, from nature uh, and the beauty of the garden. And, and that important role is increasingly recognized within the hospice movement, for example, as well as within hospitals. You know, when the feet can't travel, 
the eye still can. And we can imaginatively project ourselves into, into our surroundings um, and feel part of something larger. And a garden, in terms of the timelines in a garden, a garden exposes us to both the transience of life and the continuity of life through the cycle of the seasons. And that's one of the very important reasons why gardens can be so consoling um, at, at any point in life when people are facing loss or bereavement. I'm gonna show you this one further slide of our garden at home. And this is uh, the delphiniums in full flower in July. And these, the blue of these flowers is really remarkable. And they absolutely, every year without fail, stop me in my tracks. I have to stand and gaze at them. Beauty is a very important uh, aspect of what it is about the natural world that replenishes us. The experience of beauty is, 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 is fascinating and unique in a sense. We experience a dissolving of the boundary between ourselves and the beautiful object. So something shifts within us, we're taken out of ourselves. It's actually a quality that um, the philosopher Iris Murdoch referred to as unselfing. And the feeling of peacefulness and contentment and connectedness that many people experience in natural settings has a lot to do with this fundamental experience of beauty. The neuroscience of experiencing beauty shows also that beauty really is neurologically replenishing. It activates the emotional centers in the brain, particularly the medial orbital frontal cortex, and is associated with release of endorphins, serotonin, and dopamine. And we can experience this feeling of unselfing in other ways of being taken out of ourselves certainly in the garden, through the work itself, through the methodical, rhythmical work of weeding, uh, hoeing, um, sowing seeds, focusing very closely on these kind of mindful activities. I'm going to briefly introduce Donald Winnicott because he really influenced my thinking about um, how important the experience of creativity is to us. He wrote about this in a number of his books, uh, often in relation to children's play, but also how important it is for adults to have a creative uh, outlet in some form or other. Gardening can be a very accessible form of creativity because uh, we don't have to do all the creative work. It's, it's a coming together of human creativity and, and nature's creativity. But he also wrote about um, a concept he called transitional space. And this idea is fundamentally that when we're engaged in something imaginative, whether it's playful or creative, that we inhabit a space, a notional space that is between reality and fantasy. And the idea of the in-between is very important when we think about gardens. Gardens occupy a zone between art and nature, for example. They also inhabit uh, a physical in-between space. They occupy an area between the home and the outside world. And also when it comes to hospitals, between the hospital and the outside world. And I'm gonna show you a slide from a very beautiful hospital garden uh, in the UK. It's located at Salisbury District General Hospital in the Spinal Injuries Unit. Uh, and this garden was created in 2012 by a rather wonderful charity uh, that was set up around that time called Horatio's Gardens. And since creating this first garden, they've gone on to create six other gardens in the UK, all in spinal injuries units. And my husband, Tom, designed one which opened just at the beginning of the pandemic at the spinal injuries unit that's closest to our home. There are 11 of these units in the country and the charity's aim is to ensure that every spinal unit has, has a garden. 
Patients in these units are in hospital for a very long time, often six months, sometimes nine months. And they're also facing a life-changing injury, uh, a great deal of trauma to process and loss to process. The garden gives them a place that takes them out of themselves but also a place where they can sit and be and actually go into themselves and process some of the emotions that they're having to deal with. The gardens are also a wonderful place for relatives to come and visit and also for the staff actually. The staff certainly value the gardens highly and report uh, feeling you know, much, much lower stress levels as a result of having access to the gardens during the day. One of the patients I interviewed here spoke about how crucial the garden had been. He was a young man uh, and he felt without the garden, he wouldn't have been able to keep in touch with many of his friends. But he felt because of the garden, he could ask them to come and visit. They didn't have to come into the hospital. And what he said was, it's a kind of place where you all want to be. All the Horatius gardens are planted with maximal seasonal variation. And that's obviously crucial when people are looking at them day in, day out. But it tends to be a feature of many gardens that we experience the seasons and we experience variation. And a garden is a great place to experience a little bit of novelty each day. There's always something changing, something new. Now, I'm also going to just mention the importance of gardens uh, for prisoners. I mentioned it briefly earlier. It's a slide taken on Rikers Island and the jail complex in New York. It's the Horticultural Society of New York who run this project. And it's been a very successful project. It's been running since the mid eighties, but it's expanded enormously in the last five years or so. One of the things that struck me in interviewing the prisoners here was how working with the forces of growth in nature and seeing the products of their work, harvesting the squash plants, for example, to help men and women who really wanted to change their lives, but could not see a way forward to do that, help them feel that, that perhaps they could change their lives. And I think it's something very important that happens when we work with nature in this way, that we can internalize the idea of regeneration. We can internalize the idea of change and it becomes possible to think about that in relation to ourselves. I've got a few more slides of, um, I thought I'd include something from California. So this is San Quentin Jail. This is the Insight Garden Program that now that was established here but is now running in eight prisons uh, throughout California. This program and the Rikers Island program have quite compelling uh, results in terms of reoffending rates. So the standard reoffending rate for prisoners is uh, around 60%. That means 60% of prisoners are back inside after three years. But for those who attend the HORTS program and the INSIGHT program, the rate is as low as 10 to 15%. And one of the strengths of these programs, which I think really helps them achieve that, is that they enable prisoners when they're released from prison to carry on uh, gardening afterwards, either through internships or other kinds of programs in the community. And uh, this is one last slide. Uh, of the creation of new beds at San Quentin. And I don't know if you can see in the bottom right hand corner of the who founded this project. And I think it's important to mention that, you know, which I'm talking about the effects of gardening on people, but it is very much mediated by the horticultural therapists and the people working in these gardens who understand, who tune in to what stage people are at. Uh, what they're ready to do, whether they need to work in a group that day, whether they need to work on their own, and so on. The, the human contact is very much part of the process. Just to end, I'm going to reflect on um, what gardens have to offer in terms of communities and community building. So this is a slide of the construction of a garden in the Bronx 
It's a program called the New Refugee Project, uh, and it's run by the International Rescue Committee and the New York Botanical Garden. So you can see here lots of raised beds, a very productive place right off a busy highway. And also you can see the covered area, the little market that brings people into the garden, brings other residents around into the garden to buy produce and so on. One of the very powerful effects that gardens can have in the community is helping people connect across all sorts of uh, divides, conventional divides, whether that's to do with uh, language barriers, which is certainly the case here, because uh, the refugees come from many different parts of the globe. Uh, it may be to do with age, class, and so on, race, and so on. But there's an effect that's been observed within these gardens, which has been called uh, gardening as a social bridge. That phrase was coined in a report written by the John Hopkins Center for a Livable Future that was looking at the the effects of urban farms and community gardens. And they concluded that this is the most powerful effect. It's on humans and human groups. Um, that, you know, there are many other benefits in terms of growing food locally, improving people's diets and so on. But actually it's to do with building community and creating a sense of neighborliness. And there are studies that show introducing green spaces into deprived parts of cities, reduce levels of violence, for example, as well as decreasing stress uh, in the residents around. They don't necessarily have to be gardening as long as they have a view of the green space. So for example, uh, levels of cortisol, salivary cortisol, the stress hormone cortisol, have been found to re be reduced in um, urban residents who live near green space when compared to, to people who are deprived of green space. And one of the things we know about green space, particularly in a city context, is that it helps to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And so often in the city, we're on sympathetic drive. You know, we're, we're, we, we have to have our antennae out about what's, you know, who's around us, is it safe? And also, you know, it's a noisy environment often and it may be dusty, it may be polluted. And gardens can help mitigate all of those features. I've got one last uh, community garden in the US just to, just to mention. This is the, the Windy City Youth Harvest Farm in Chicago. It's uh, run by the Chicago Botanic Garden and it enrolls kids who are regarded as being at risk in some way. And they attend this project a couple of days a week and also through the summer vacation. And of course, these kids, they benefit from so many of the effects I've already been talking about in relation to green spaces, the safe environment, of the garden and the and the anti stress effects of, of nature on us and the feelings of empowerment and self belief that can come from from being creative from growing food that is nourishing from growing flowers that are beautiful. The other very important feature about this in terms of understanding what a garden like this can offer is that the, the safety of the space and the, the pro-social effects that I mentioned just now mean that gardens are a very good place to foster trust and trust is fundamental to learning. Uh, we don't take in new learning unless we trust its source and unless we are feeling a sense of, of belonging in some way as well. And gardens help create, I think, an ideal environment, not only for plants to thrive, but for people to thrive. And the very last thing I'm going to mention is, is a homegrown project that I'm currently developing very close to our home in an orchard with my husband, Tom. The building you can see in the orchard here was designed by our son, Ben, who's an architect. And it's, um, it's just beginning to rise out of the ground. So it's very exciting. Behind it, there's a small nursery in which uh, a learning disability charity called Sunnyside Rural Trust that helps young adults with um, various conditions, including autism, 
Down syndrome, for example, uh, helps them through horticultural therapy and also training, ultimately provides them with a source of work. So we will be working very closely with them and they're already starting to grow plants, perennial plants for some of Tom's projects, including a garden that he did at the Hampton Court Flower Show very recently in July. Um, and the bit in front of the building, on the lower part, on the lower left, is small vegetable plots, which we set up. They're already functioning. We set them up at the beginning of the pandemic. And there are seven families who all live within walking distance of us who are growing vegetables there. And during the lockdowns, that garden space was a very lovely, convivial, safe outdoor space in which people could connect. The other side of the, the image on the upper right is something that Tom is calling a plant library. And it's already sort of planted up, but it will be a place where people can come and look at a wide variety of plants and learn about how plants grow, what they look like, what conditions they grow best under, because we're very lucky in this site. We have the middle part of the site is quite dry and sandy and the, the further flung part of the site against the trees is actually very wet, it's a band of clay. So we can grow a wide range of different plants in this setting. And we're sort of also linking up with schools local to us and a youth counselling uh, charity. Uh, the idea being to provide a community resource. You know, many of the things that I write about in the book um, can actually begin to happen. So it's very exciting, it's work in progress. I'm going to end there and hopefully there'll be some discussion and questions. Thank you, Sue. This was very inspiring and beautiful and nourishing on many levels. We appreciate your uh, illuminating all the various applications of horticultural therapy. And a question came in regarding the efforts to offer what would be a preventive or protective uh, benefit from horticultural projects and specifically in the elementary or uh, grade school setting. And could you speak to what you know about any such efforts? Yeah, there's a bit in my book about school gardening as well. And, and actually, because we're going to be working with schools in the garden that we're creating here. Well, I think school gardening is really vital in the age that we're living in. I don't see how children can learn about where food comes from, uh, can learn about biodiversity, for example, you know, why we need to protect uh, the bees and the other pollinators. So I think it's absolutely vital from that point of view. And, and I was very inspired when I came to, to Berkeley as part of my research to go um, to the wonderful um, Alice Waters uh, garden. I visited there and attended a lesson there. And you know that that of course has been a pioneer in school gardening around the world, not just in the U.S. So so I think that's important. But also I think what's very important and and some the RHS here, the Royal Horticultural Society here, have a very good program supporting schools. And what their research shows is that in terms of its impact, school gardens have have greatest impact on kids who are not. Um, not necessarily the ones who are at the top of the class, the mm. ones who may be struggling with self-esteem, the ones who, who, who feel perhaps are at risk of you know, dropping out of school and so on, ones who have various forms of learning difficulties, um, but actually the physical aspects of gardening, growing things, seeing the results of what they've done is enormously important in terms of building their self-belief and their self-confidence. So it's very good for self-esteem. And I think that's important. We also know that, that green environments have a beneficial effect on cognition. You know, taking a break from a screen, for example, taking a break from, from reading, um, taking a break from, you know, anything that's very cognitively sort of task focused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Taking a break from that and walking through nature or getting your hands in the soil in the garden has been shown, this is some very um, important research, which was started in the 80s, attention restoration theory, 
uh, by Stephen and Rachel Kaplan. And, and that, that those findings, their findings, um, uh, have been replicated in many, many recent studies as well, that, that actually in terms of our mental focus, uh, having green surroundings is important. Thank you. We have a comment that was uh, contributed while you were highlighting these insights. It says the biodiversity can also help children accept each other and internalize the idea of diversity among humans. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. I think that's a very important point, actually. And actually, uh, you know, one of the things that came through quite strongly in, in the interviews that I did, particularly with some of the very inspiring people running uh, some of the horticultural projects I visited, was that what they observed was that also caring for plants was a very, um, uh, was, a, was an effective way and an unthreatening way in which to learn about and understand what it means to care for people. And I think it brings together very beautifully the idea that, you know, that caring for, we, we're not fundamentally separate from our environments. You know, we need to care for the environment, we need to care for each other. Um, and we live at a time when care has really come to be devalued. You know, as I said earlier in the talk, you know, it's, it's often seen as a depleting activity or an undesirable activity, mm -hmm. even sometimes a demeaning activity. Mm -hmm. um, but care is, is vital to health, to the health of the planet and to the health of communities, the health, the health of individuals. Right. The other question is, we saw the examples of collaborative and group setting uh, for gardening and is there anything you are aware of in terms of um, city planning that would facilitate more opportunities for individuals to come together outside of a therapeutic um, mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. to just come together like in the in the commons to garden yes, yes yeah, absolutely well I think this is a very important point and I think the pandemic has really highlighted the value of green space in cities. You know, ordinary people have understood how much it has to offer, but it's also highlighted the great disparity in terms of particularly more socially deprived parts of cities that are very often lacking green space. Now, you know, there are, there are different ways. I mean, I think planners need to take note of this. Um, I cite quite a lot of the evidence in my book. Some of it is very robust. Um, there's, for example, a, a large pan-European study um, that looked at a range of interventions within cities in, in areas of deprivation uh, and measured their impact on, on health and particularly mental health. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that the only one that consistently had an impact, um, and this included things like introducing closer shops and so on, um, mm -hmm. Was, was introducing green space. Mm -hmm. and, and when they ran, I mean, they ran a sort of very complex sort of epidemiological set of calculations, but they calculated that green space can offset the mental health disadvantages uh, of, of, econ of sort of low economic uh, status by as much as 40%, that's four zero percent. Mm -hmm. So that's a very big effect. Um, in terms of what, what, what green space can offer people in terms of their sense of well-being and their sense of thriving. So it's really not to be underestimated. I also think, you know, I write about guerrilla gardening as well. And of course, that's another way to address this. There are many wonderful examples, you know, the, the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society have been working um, with, a, with a large research study uh, Charles Branas from Columbia University uh, for over a decade now, um, greening up vacant lots and, and finding, you know, finding through follow up, very extensive follow up, sign really significant effects, reduction on gun violence, for example, um, uh, reduced levels of depression. Um, and that's, that's by turning around disused space, neglected space. And, um, and that's something that, you know, that can also be done and can be done by community organizations. 
You know, mm. I, I write about a project in the book called the Incredible Edible Project that started in north of Manchester here in a very rundown uh, post-industrial mill town. And, and, um, and it's gone on to, to you know, spawn, I think there are 1,200 uh, incredible edible projects now around the world, all, all with the same idea that, you know, that groups of people come together, they, they care for the town in various ways, they look after disused and derelict areas, um, and, and they bring people together. If someone is seeking a therapeutic uh, program that centers this wisdom that you've spoken about, how would one search in their country? Some people <laughs> yeah. are. Well, I mean, it, it, horticultural therapy, community gardens, I think, I think you have to, it, it, it is a problem, I think, that, that it's not very well mapped. And there's a wonderful GP in this country who has who's realized this um, because, for example, social prescribing is something that family doctors are increasingly doing here, which is trying to link people with community projects or horticultural projects, um, you know, as an alternative or, or in addition to antidepressants. Mm -hmm. um, and what he's doing in this country is mapping all these small projects. Mm -hmm. um and uh and i get that that kind of thing does need to happen because i was just blown away when i started researching my book about how many small unrecognized as it were projects there are you know who are quietly getting on with this kind of work mm -hmm. um on a, on a very small scale but often often set up by and driven by very um in energetic um inspiring people Thank you, we'll, we'll look forward to those uh, databases being available internationally as people hear this calling. We have another final category of questions that have to do with the distinction between attending to an existing ecosystem and uh, gardening that may uh, preserve or enrich soil through such as mentioned biointensive gardening uh, versus other forms of gardening that may not center uh, the theme of soil restoration and regenerative practices. Um, mm, I'm not quite sure what the question is saying. I mean, I think what, what I would say is all, all therapeutic gardens are, are organic. Um, I didn't come across any that weren't. Um, uh, and I think, you know, I think actually, yes, I mean, gardening per se is not necessarily, uh, it doesn't have to be good for our health or good for the planet, you know. Um, it can use far too much water, use far too many chemicals. Um, and actually, you know, gardening can be a burden if you take on a big plot and particularly if you're doing it on your own, um, it can be, you know, exhausting uh, and feel like a big burden. So, so I think, yeah, I think it is important. I feel that where we're living now in the 21st century, gardening needs, needs to shift uh, undoubtedly towards something that is restorative for people, but also restorative of, of the soils and, and our, and our uh, you know, our wildlife. Thank you. One final question, uh, perhaps you address this in your book, is were there reports on dose effects or time for... Yeah, that's a very good question and I do address that. I mean, you know, for instance, the Alnut project that I showed is a 12 week program, fairly intensive 12 week program, which gets good results. Mm -hmm. the, the, the project I showed before that at Bridewell is, uh, is a two year program. So there are very different kinds of timescales. Mm -hmm. And Ana another uh, bit of research that I cite in the book is looking at um, vegetable gardening and community gardens and found that actually as little as 30 minutes a week had a significant effect on, on people's mental health. Mm -hmm. so, so you don't necessarily have to do a lot of it to, mm -hmm. to reap the benefit. Mm -hmm. Sue, thank you for uh, illuminating all the wonders of gardening and for your wonderful book. And I encourage everyone who hasn't already re read it to resource yourself with the wisdom it provides. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure to you. Thank you.
Thank you.